Let us on. All right. Thank, thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you especially to our organizers for making this conference possible. My name is Lauren Harmon, and I'm excited to be presenting Chromophobe on behalf of the Tim Trish Lab at the Van Andel Institute. So first off, as a little bit of background, we know that eukaryotic cells have two meters of DNA which needs to fit into a tiny nucleus. The way that this is done is that the DNA is wound around histone octamers, also referred to nucleosomes, much like um, string could be wound around beads. And this is referred to as chromatin. So these histones have various chemical modifications to them, such as methylation or acetylation. And these are written and erased by different proteins. And importantly, they are also read by proteins, which are able to recognize combinations of these chemical histone modifications and execute a set of instructions based on um, these marks. So in 2001, Genuine and Alice proposed that these histone modifications could be thought of as a histone code, which is conserved from many organisms such as yeast to, hu to humans, and it dictates or it provides the instructions for which chromatin is wound and unwound, which controls regulation and repair. Now, these histone readers are able to um, recognize and execute based on these um, on these histone marks, but for us researchers, it can be a little bit more nebulous to interpret this. And so because of this, Ernst and Kellis in, in 2010 developed a hidden Markov model, or Chrome HMM, which can be used to um, learn and interpret the chromatin states that the nucleosomes are in based on histone marks. And just to provide a little spark notes version of the way that this happens, so the chromatin marks are, are binarized, so they're defined as either present or absent in a given location on the genome. And then the user is able to define a finite number of hidden states. Um, and then based on this, it, the algorithm determines the emission probabilities. So this is the probability that any given mark is found in a given state. And then it also determines transition probabilities. So this is the probability that um, a, this is the probability that a state will be transitioning from one state to another. And so the main idea here is that Chrome HMM is able to learn de novo from the data based on the histone marks, where we might be seeing an enhancer, a promoter, um, and what might be active or transcribed. And since Chrome HMM has been developed, there have been many modifications that have been made to it in order to expand the biological capabilities. One example is a stacked or per cell type model. There is also Chrome gene, which is able to um, predict based on the gene, whether it's active or repressed. And what I'd really like to highlight here is SC Chrome HMM, which has been developed by Zhang and Sri Srivastava. And so I really encourage you guys to listen to Avi's recording later on. But what this is able to do is it looks at the posterior state probabilities. So what Chrome HMM does is it um, predicts the most likely state that a genome is, is in at any given location. But of course, with any of these predictions, there is a probability that is associated with this. So for some regions in the genome, we are more confident than others. And so SC Chrome HMM takes advantage of this um, additional quantitative information. And so this brings me to our work on our package, Chromophobe. And of course, I am somewhat preaching to the choir here with this audience, but we know that BioC has many power tools that um, really can facilitate genomic analysis. So using things like our track layer, our, our SAM tools, and BioC Parallel, um, we are able to facilitate the import and extraction of models. We're able to use genomic ranges, which can make queries easier. So in this example here, we're extracting the poised regions and then subsetting based on that. We're also able to use um, motif analysis packages such as Mona Lisa and Motif Breaker 
and able to facilitate facilitate interpretation of these results, such as which transcription factors are being regulated here. And then also null ranges, which is going to be presented later on, which is really useful for hypothesis testing. Chromophobe is also useful for adding new diagnostic plots and providing tools for working with these Chrome HMM models. So it's able to use genomic segmentation to add a track line for X4 and course to and from G ranges. It's able to do simplification, recoloring, and compression of the HMMs. And then one of the things that we are very excited about is that it's able to plot these posterior probabilities. So in this plot that I'm showing here, you can see the posterior probabilities. And you can see that in different regions in the genome, we have different amounts of confidence that that genome is in a particular state. And so, as you can imagine, as you are doing your biological interpretation of your data, it's important to know um, what is the probability that a state assignment is actually correct. And just as an example as to how we can use chromophobe, We've been working on a project with our collaborators from the Krosik lab, and the goal of this project is to understand how dendritic cells, which are specialized immune cells, are able to undergo chromatin changes um, in response to a stimuli. So in this, in this project, we looked at three different strains of mice, and they were treated with either LCMV, which is a mouse virus, or PBS, which is a control. And then we looked at the RNA and attack seq data, as well as um, different chromatin marks, or histone marks, sorry. And then using this data, we applied the 18-state roadmap Chrome HMM, and we really focused in on these bivalent regions. And so as you can see from the donut plots, as we moved from PBS to LCMV, so the virus-stimulated mice, um, these bivalent regions were decreased. And if we further looked into the transcription factors using Mona, Mona Lisa, we were able to see that it was mostly Etsy factors and the NF kappa B slash rel factors that were enriched and that were really um, causing this change that we saw as the dendritic cells responded to the mouse virus. And so just to summarize, we are undergoing active development for chromophobe. We want to polish it up and get it ready to be published on Bioconductor. But as of right now, we do think that it is very useful. Um, this plot here shows how using chromophobe, it's able to facilitate the analysis and visualization of these Chrome HMM models. And we're able to see, so for example, here we can see that triples two, which is important for dendritic cells, is different based on mouse strain and cell type. And so this is able to um, help us to make novel biological discoveries. And chromophobe is able to facilitate these sorts of analyses. And I would just like to thank, of course, everyone in my lab who helped with this project, especially Tim Trish and Ava Jensen, who are here. Please say hi to them. And of course, our collaborators and our funders. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. see any online yet, but just in a, a minute, so just wait for some chat. Um, if not, please feel free to ask in the, please feel free to ask questions in the chat, and uh, we'll prepare our slide deck for our next speaker, who's J Jacob Morrison from the Shen Lab. Um, give me one moment, Jacob, and I'll put, pull your slides up. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, please ask any questions in the uh, WebEx.